Welcome, I'm Valerie Forbes. I'm Dean of the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science, and I want to give a warm welcome to all of our guests this evening. Uh, thank you all for joining us at the Nat and Dorothy Hyman Lecture Series to hear Dr. Sarah Hobby speak about managing pollution in urban waters, sources and solutions. The Nat and Dorothy Hyman Science Lecture Series would not be possible without Florida Atlantic alumnus Jerry Hyman, who is the son of Nat and Dorothy Hyman. The series was created to encourage and inspire students in the sciences and provide access free of charge to educational lectures by leaders in the scientific fields for FAU students, faculty, and community members. Jerry couldn't be with he us here today, but I understand he may be tuning in from home. So hi, Jerry, and thank you. Um, so today we have Dr. Sarah Hobby, a former colleague of mine from University of Minnesota, who is a distinguished researcher and professor of ecology, evolution, and behavior. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, as well as the Academy of Distinguished Teachers at the University of Minnesota, a fellow of the Ecological Society of America, and she has multiple awards and recognitions as an outstanding researcher, educator, faculty member, and advisor, just to mention a few of her many accomplishments. Sarah's research spans a number of focus areas, including the influence of climate change on ecosystem processes, how plant species can influence biogeochemical cycles, and the effects of urbanization on biodiversity. Her work can bring her to a desolate frozen tundra, a fact I just learned today, um, or a bustling city landscape. She earned her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and was a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University before moving to University of Minnesota. Now back to the topic of this talk today, water pollution and how to manage it. An issue we unfortunately must grapple with as residents of South Florida. And in South Florida, our urban waters are also part of the intercoastal and freshwater systems that all feed into the Everglades or the Atlantic Ocean. Our scientists at FAU study how harmful algal blooms, along with sewage and other threats, negatively impact the environment, wildlife, human health, and the economy. Pollution from various sources and other human-caused threats are becoming more frequent and severe, which is one of the reasons we recently launched the FAU School of Environmental, Coastal, and Ocean Sustainability. And because that's a mouthful, we call it ECOS for short. The new school is a partnership between the Schmidt, Schmidt College of Science and FAU's Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. ECOS will be the umbrella under which our environmental research, education, and community engagement are coordinated, increasing the visibility and the impact of our work and serving as a clear point of contact for our partners in the public, profit, public private, and non-profit sectors. That was a lot of peace. The environmental challenges that we face today are locally, regionally, and globally are increasingly complex, and addressing them effectively will, will require us to collaborate across disciplinary and sectoral boundaries. We've created ECOS to do just this. You can learn more about ECOS and all of our other programs, or many of our other programs, at the tables in the back of the room after the talk. Uh, we'll also be having additional environment-related events in the coming months as part of the ECOS launch. In particular, we will host two expert panel debates, at the end, one at the end of January, one at the end of February, that are open to the public. Um, and further details about these, they were circulating on the screen, and there's some information in the back. We'll also have time for Q&A with Sarah following her talk, so please have your questions ready. And this will be followed by an informal reception, which is right next door to which all of you are warmly invited. So now I would like to welcome our featured speaker for this year's Nat and Dorothy Hyman Lecture, Dr. Sarah Hobby. Thank you. Thanks very much, Valerie. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I had a really lovely day chatting with people and meeting a lot of new folks, and I'm honored to be invited to give this named lecture. So thank you so much for having me. Um, So we get a lot of, or people who live in cities get a lot of benefits from urban surface waters, um, including things like food and recreational benefits and cultural benefits, aesthetic benefits, climate regulation, um, fresh drinking water. Um, but 
our urban waters often suffer um, from what we call non-point source pollution. So in many parts of the world, we've made a great deal of progress in cleaning up our, our sewage. Um, but we still have these persistent pollution problems that we refer to as non-point source pollution because they're coming from lots and lots of different sources. Um, and so they lead to things like eutrophication or the excessive growth of algae. And I think here in South Florida, you're, you're familiar with harmful algal blooms. So we similarly have excessive algal growth in our urban surface waters up in Minnesota. Um, and this is largely caused by excess inputs of nutrients, particularly phosphorus um, and also nitrogen in some cases. So even though we've made a lot of progress in cleaning up water, we still have um, a ways to go. And these uh, water pollution is particularly exacerbated by the urban form, what, the way we've created our urban environments. So in our urban environments, we have a lot of what we call impervious surfaces. We have buildings and parking lots and uh, roads. Um, and none of that material allows uh, water to sink into the ground. And so in order to try to minimize flooding, we've created storm drainage networks in order to try to rapidly you know, move that water off the landscape and prevent flooding. Um, but at the same time that this water you know, moves rapidly down, down storm drains, it, carry, it can carry with it a lot of material that can cause um, water problems downstream. And so in an urban system, our headwater streams often are essentially our city streets. And so we can contrast a non-urban headwater stream that we might find in a forested area with our city streets, what I think of as the headwater streams in, in many cities, um, and they're really different from one another. So our non-urban stream might have vegetation around it, so a riparian zone. There's probably, we know that there are things living in the stream that can hold on to pollutants like nutrients. Um, but our, our city streets lack that you know, riparian vegetation. And once material is in the street, there's very little opportunity for it to basically be taken up by living things. Um, and so it can readily be moved downstream. And downstream often looks like this. So um, where I live in Minnesota, we have a lot of surface water. And yet in the metro area, we have very few streams actually that you can see because most of them are buried in pipes like this. And again, this pipe is really different from an open stream in that it has you know, very little um, in the way of biota living in it that can retain pollutants, nutrients especially, as they move downstream. Um, and clearly, we don't have wetlands you know, interacting with this water body. Um, so we have a really different situation in many of our urban um, systems when it comes to water. So today, what I want to talk about is um, some work that we've been doing over the years, taking a watershed approach to understanding urban nutrient pollution. And then I'm going to talk about some management opportunities and challenges that we've been um, grappling with. And then I'll talk about some new research directions. And I want to put the work that I'm going to talk about in the context of a pretty new project. Um, so I'm going to be talking about work that we've been doing over the past decade or so. But I'm going to put it under the umbrella of a new project, the Minneapolis-St. Paul Urban Long-Term Ecological Research Program. Um, so this is a project that we got funded um, a, a little over two years ago. Um, and it's part of a network of sites that are funded by the National Science Foundation to do long-term ecological research. So there are 27 sites in the network. They span from the Arctic all the way to Antarctica. Most of the sites are not in urban systems. They're in a diversity of different kinds of ecosystems. And those projects are funded on a six-year funding cycle to enable long-term study. There currently are two urban sites in the network. So um, up, you know, us up in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and then the Central Arizona Phoenix um, site has been around since the mid-90s. You all have a long-term ecological research site here in Florida, the Florida Coastal Everglades site. 
Um, and you have, I know, at least one faculty member who works as part of the FCE. So uh, we're, our site is actually the, the entire seven county metro region of the Twin Cities. Um, so it includes Minneapolis and St. Paul, but actually over 100 municipalities um, and seven counties. So it's a pretty complicated um, system from a governance perspective. And this is kind of the framework that we're using for our LTER. We're really interested in understanding interactions between people and nature in cities, both to understand how urban stressors impact ecosystems, but also to understand how people are being benefited by and burdened by um, urban nature. Um, ultimately, to inform approaches to addressing inequities um, in you know, who benefits and who is burdened by uh, urban nature. And we're looking at interactions between the social system and urban nature across scales in each. So for example, in urban nature, we're looking at organisms within habitats, within drainage networks, within whole landscapes. In, on the social side, we're considering decision making from the scale of individuals to groups to municipalities on up to the entire metro region. And we're focusing on kind of a set of four different questions. We're interested in understanding the interactive effects of urban stressors, climate change, um, biodiversity variability, land use change management on terrestrial ecosystems. We're also uh, studying the same sort of suite of questions uh, focused on aquatic ecosystems, so lakes and streams and stormwater. But on the social side, we're really interested in how decision making, both present day decision making, but also decisions that were made in the past have led to environmental inequities. So inequities in terms of who benefits from urban nature. And then finally, we're interested in how um, con engaging the community um, in, uh, in research leads to different scientific and community outcomes. So I'm not going to be able to talk at all about all the work that we're doing in this LTER project. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a story about research that we've been doing you know, over quite a long time, and then use that as an opportunity to bring up um, some of the newer work that we're doing as part of this LTER project. OK, so I'm going to be focused primarily um, on uh, aquatic systems today, so thinking about um, factors that influence uh, water quality in the urban system and lead to impaired water quality. And we're interested in water in the upper Midwest or in Minneapolis, St. Paul in particular, because we have a lot of water. We have a lot of surface water. You've probably heard we're the land of 10,000 lakes. Actually, most people think we have many more lakes than 10,000. But just in the metro, we have a huge number of lakes. Uh, we also have the Mississippi, the Mississippi and the Minnesota River coming together um, in this region. And many of those water bodies continue to be impaired even after you know, millions of dollars that have been spent on trying to improve water quality in the region. So this is just one uh, figure showing that. So this is a map that comes from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency where you know, for um, over 1,000 lakes that they have assessed, 70% um, of those um, they have designated as impaired for one or more stressor. And those are the lakes that are shown in red. Um, and the most important stressors uh, that these water bodies are experiencing relate to either excess nutrient loading or chloride. Um, and I understand you have chloride issues here as well. Our chloride issues are different in that they're coming from the use of road salt uh, in the winter time. But I'm going to be focusing primarily on nutrients today. So this is just, again, another picture of a, a lake actually in my neighborhood. Um, and you can see this excessive algal growth that leads to a suite of problems that I'm sure you're familiar with. OK, so I'm going to start then by talking about work that we've been doing, um, taking a watershed approach to understanding urban nutrient pollution. And so what, about, what do I mean by taking a watershed approach? So really what we're doing is we're borrowing a, an approach that was pioneered um, in the White Mountains of New Hampshire at Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest, where 
the researchers that were working there recognized that, you know, if you examine a, a small watershed and you can quantify the water and materials coming into that watershed, and then down at the bottom of the watershed, you can you compare the, that to the water and materials leaving the watershed in streams, in the stream water, that can give you insight into how that watershed is functioning. And so we've been taking um, a similar approach in the urban environment, but recognizing that our urban watersheds are functioning really differently from um, non-urban watersheds. And so this is my attempt at a cartoon <laughs> of a watershed. Um, so on the left, we have a non-urban watershed. Um, so we have some streams that are feeding into this lake um, with a wetland um, present. And if we're trying to understand um, the nutrient pollution that's being exported to that downstream water body that we care about, whether it's the lake or the coast, then it can be helpful to understand what are the nutrient inputs to the watershed. How are those nutrients cycling through soils and into the headwater streams and further being cycled as they move downstream um, and potentially through wetlands? So if we think about our urban watershed, the structure of that urban watershed is really different, right? So we've constructed this dense drainage network that reaches up high into the watershed. And so we probably have more nutrients coming into that watershed. And we also have very little opportunity for those nutrients to be captured um, as water makes its way into the headwater streams, the streets, and the storm drainage network. And there's very little opportunity then for those nutrients to be trapped or captured as they make their way down into this water body. And so um, we've been basically taking this small watershed approach in our storm sewer sheds. Um, so we've been basically looking at, you know, what are the pollutants, the nutrient pollutants that are coming out of these watersheds and comparing that to the inputs of nutrient pollution to the watershed in order to gain some insights into how these watersheds are functioning. And we're able to do this because we don't have these pipes, the storm drainage network in the Twin Cities is pretty well maintained, so we don't have a lot of leakage um, out of or into uh, these storm drains. Okay. So I'm just going to pause here and acknowledge that I'm going to be telling you a story about a place that's super different from where you are right now. Um, and I had to kind of grapple with that. At first, I felt super guilty about it. And then I thought, well, no, that's OK. Maybe they'd be interested in learning about another place. And so I want to point out some similarities, but also acknowledge that there are big differences between um, you know, watersheds in Minnesota and watersheds in Florida. But hopefully what I'll tell you today might spark you to think differently about um, the watersheds here in Florida. So I will say that there are some similarities. Um, Non-point nutrient pollution is important in both regions. Um, in both regions, we have separated sanitary and storm sewers. Um, from my understanding of reading on the internet. Um, and so what that means is that Every, the, what goes into the storm drain does not receive centralized treatment. Um, and so that's the case both in Minnesota and in Florida. Um, we have abundant surface water in both um, regions, and clean water is highly valued. Um, and we're also talking about heavily urbanized areas in both cases. But I also acknowledge that there's a whole bunch of complexity in the Florida system that we don't have to grapple with in Minnesota. We don't have the Everglades to the west and the coast um, to the east. And so like, this is a really complicated system. Um, and so obviously, there are some big differences. And you have other issues that you're dealing with here that you know, I, I won't have to talk about today. All right. So in taking this watershed approach, then we asked, what are the sources of nutrients to urban watersheds? Once these nutrients get into the watershed, are they held in the watershed, or are they exported where they can have downstream um, detrimental effects? And what are the major, if they are exported, what are the major pathways that are causing that, that export? 
So I'm going to start with just asking, OK, what are the sources of nutrients to urban watersheds? And so this work was done in a, a smaller subset of watersheds of the uh, subwatersheds of the Mississippi and St. Paul. And we focused on this area because we were able to partner with a local watershed district that had collected year-on data on um, stormwater nutrient export. So in this figure, each of these colored blobs represents a different watershed. Um, and at the bottom of the watershed, Capital Region Watershed District, our partner in this work, um, maintained a monitoring station and measured basically annual export of nutrients from these watersheds. And so then we were able to basically, for these same watersheds, come up with um, estimates of all the inputs of, of nutrients to these watersheds. So then we could put those data together and ask about nutrient retention. And to come up with estimates of all the nutrient inputs, we used a variety of approaches, and I'm not going to go into any detail about that. But if you have questions about how we came up with these estimates, I'm happy to answer those. We used household surveys. We used models. We used field work. So a variety of different methods to get at the numbers that I'm going to show you. All right, so this figure shows our estimates of watershed nutrient inputs for each of these seven watersheds. And so you don't need to know what they are, but I've arranged them in these graphs from the most residential on the left to the least residential on the right. And we have a panel for nitrogen and a panel for phosphorus. Um, if we look at nitrogen, um, so these are basically the inputs of nitrogen, so the new inputs of nitrogen to the watershed. Um, in kilograms of nitrogen per square kilometer of watershed area per year. Um, so if you look at nitrogen, you can see that the dominant input is residential fertilizer, okay? So that represents a new input of nitrogen to the watershed. The second biggest in input is atmospheric deposition. And the third most important is actually household pet waste. It's actually dog waste. So I want to just explain that for a minute. So. Um, when, if you have a dog, so how many of you have a dog? Yeah, a bunch of you have a dog. Uh, yeah, okay, it's not, you don't have to be ashamed of your dogs just because <laughs> I'm telling you that they're an important input of nitrogen and phosphorus to the watershed. Um, so you go to the store and you buy pet food for your dog. That nitrogen and phosphorus that's in that pet food, um, that came, that originated from outside of the watershed, right? Like everything that went into making your pet food happened outside of the watershed. You bought, then it was you know, brought to your store that you bought the pet food, you fed the pet food to your pet, and then you know, some fraction of that, those nutrients end up in the landscape um, in the form of urine, because um, your dogs all pee outside, I'm assuming, most of the time, hopefully. Um, <laughs> or you know, some fraction doesn't get picked up. And so you know, we have some survey data that suggests what fraction that is on average. Um, and so, um, so that's nitrogen. If we look at phosphorus, you don't see any green bar. And that's because in the state of Minnesota, we, we have a law in place that restricts the use of phosphorus in lawn fertilizer. Is there such a restriction in the state of Florida? OK, so there are about a dozen states that have those kinds of restrictions in place. Um, so we don't have residential fertilizer as a phosphorus source. Um, so that means that pet waste actually becomes the, the most important input of phosphorus to the watershed, um, along with atmospheric uh, deposition. OK, so now we're going to ask, are those nutrients that are coming into the watershed retained or exported? And so to answer this question, I'm just going to focus on phosphorus today. Um, well, actually, to back up. So then we have to compare the inputs to the exports. And so I told you that we had data on exports through the storm water um, from our partner, Capital Region Watershed District. But we also needed to come up with estimates of other ways that phosphorus and nitrogen are being taken out of the watershed, primarily through um, yard waste. So the, the most important pathway or, or um, way that nutrients are being exported is through stormwater. OK, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compare what's being exported in the storm drain, so that's the y-axis here, to 
the, what's coming into the watershed. And in this case, I'm looking at total inputs minus what's being removed through yard waste. And this dashed line is the one-to-one -one line. So if these points uh, fell on the one-to-one -one line, that would mean that all of the nutrients coming into the watershed on an annual basis are basically, there, an equivalent amount is being exported from the watershed. Um, and each of these dots in this case represents one of those watersheds. Um, and so what you can see is that the, 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 the data fall pretty close to that one-to-one -one line, which means that these watersheds are pretty leaky for phosphorus. They don't hold on to phosphorus, which is really different from non-urban watersheds where we tend to think of phosphorus as actually being pretty uh, tightly held in soils, for example. And so then we were like, okay, why are these watersheds so leaky for phosphorus? Why do they so readily lose phosphorus um, to stormwater? And so that led to our next set of questions, which are, what are the major nutrient export pathways? So this takes me back to you know, thinking about our, our urban streets or our urban headwaters uh, streams, if you will, and thinking about like, what are the ways that nutrients are moving from the landscape into this um, street and into stormwater? Because anything that ends up in the street is gonna be washed downstream into the storm drain. And so, you know, we thought, okay, it seems like there's a couple of ways that nutrients can be moved into, into stormwater. And so this is where, you know, what I'm gonna tell you may be different, you know, for Minnesota than it would be here. And so you can start to think about, well, what's happening in your watershed? Um, so in our watersheds, we recognize that we have a lot of trees that grow adjacent to streets. And these trees are taking up nutrients from the soil. They're investing those nutrients into leaves. Um, in the fall, which is when leaf drop happens in our part of the world, uh, like right now, um, the tree absorbs about half of the nutrients in that leaf before the leaf falls. Um, but otherwise, you know, those leaves are pretty nutrient rich and they land in the street. And unless they're removed somehow, say through street sweeping, that those nutrients are gonna make their way downstream. They're very bioavailable, so they can be available to, to fuel algal growth downstream. So we have litter fall from trees as being a potential pathway for moving nutrients into streets. And then we also have runoff, okay? So you know, nutrients can be carried overland um, through, um, th through runoff. Okay, so we wanted to explore this a little bit more and try to get a better sense of the importance of these different pathways. And this is just to remind me, to remind you that we don't just have litter fall in the fall. That's you know the time of year when we get the most litter fall in Minnesota. But we also have material coming into the street through litter fall in the spring. So, oops. Um, so these are actually like male flowers of uh, maple trees. Uh, we have some material coming in in the summer. So these are maple samaras uh, or seeds. Um, and then of course we have a lot of leaf litter coming in in the fall. And so we're starting to um, put together a number of different lines of evidence that indicate that trees can actually be an important source of nutrients to stormwater. Um, so this is uh, some data that was pulled together by my collaborators, Jacques Finlay and Ben Janke, um, and the dots disappeared. Okay, um, so the dots disappeared, so these just show the, the trends, but the data come from um, about 90 watersheds, um, and so you can see that there's a positive relationship between the canopy cover over the street, so the fraction of the street uh, that's covered by tree canopy, and the concentration of phosphorus and nitrogen in stormwater. And that's especially true if we look at total phosphorus, which is all the different forms of phosphorus um, coming into stormwater. Okay, so where you have more trees, you have more phosphorus in stormwater. Uh, then a graduate student of ours, Aaron Mittag, um, has done some calculations, and again, I'm not gonna go into the details of how we made these calculations, but she's calculated, like, basically kind of a back of the envelope calculation of, you know, how much of the phosphorus that's being exported in stormwater 
do we think is coming from leaf litter? And so she's um, looked at a number of watersheds where we have good annual estimates of phosphorus export. Um, and then in those watersheds, we've come up with some empirical models to estimate how much litter fall phosphorus is falling in the street. And then she's expressed those data here as a function of the percentage of the street that's covered by trees. Um, and you can see that you know, there's a positive relationship between tree canopy cover and stormwater phosphorus export. That was the data that I just showed you in the previous slide. This is now a smaller number of watersheds, but you still see that positive relationship. And the litter fall phosphorus inputs that we estimate are about you know, a little more than a half of those watershed phosphorus exports. So that's a lot of the phosphorus that's being exported in stormwater that we think is coming from litter fall into streets. Um, okay. And then finally, um, this is a study that I, we did not do. This was done by Bill Selbig, who's at the USGS in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, or he's in Middleton, right next to Madison. Um, and so he did this, this fun, you know, paired catchment study where he took a little, you know, part of a residential neighborhood that was all draining to a single storm drain. And he had one um, of these little catchments where they didn't do any street sweeping. And then he had another catchment nearby where they cleaned the streets weekly throughout um, the snow-free season. And then he measured how much phosphorus was, was draining out of this little neighborhood catchment. And you can see that the control um, unswept catchment had a lot more phosphorus being exported than the treated catchment, and particularly in the fall months. So lots of evidence now that trees can be an important source of nutrients to stormwater. Um, OK, so then what about runoff? What do we know about runoff? So it's really hard for us to isolate um, just the, the transfer of nutrients into stormwater through runoff. But we have some evidence that at certain times of the year, this is also a really important source of nutrients to streets and stormwater. So one time of year is when we get really heavy rainfall events. Um, and so we're getting heavier rainfall events, especially in the early summer um, in the upper Midwest. And so this is an example of one of those rainfall events where basically I'm looking out our window. This is our neighbor's house next door with the rain chain. And there's water essentially you know, moving from the backyard in between our two houses, down this little slope, over the sidewalk, and into the street. Um, and so we have really high hydrologic connectivity, we, we say, um, where you know, there's opportunities to move a lot of material um, into streets during these intense rain events because you're getting material carried from high up in the landscape. The other time of year when we get a lot of export of phosphorus is during the snow melt period. Um, and we think this is probably because there's either you know, material that didn't get removed from the street the previous fall that's kind of overwintered in the street, or we're getting runoff of uh, water over frozen soil. This is probably not an important mechanism <laughs> here in Florida. Um, so this is just some evidence to kind of back up what I just said. Um, so this is a little bit of a complicated graph, but bear with me, I'll explain it. So this is a single residential watershed um, in St. Paul. It happens to be the watershed where I live. Um, and we have measures of the cumulative amount of phosphorus um, coming off of this watershed in stormwater runoff um, for a number of different years. So each of the colored lines represents a different year. Um, and we have some drier years and some years where we had more precipitation. And so you can see that the drier years had less phosphorus coming off of the watershed, and the wet years had more phosphorus being exported um, from the watershed. And you can see that there are these kind of steps in the data. So those represent some of these intense rainfall events where we get a lot of phosphorus being exported in a single um, rain event. It's really hard to make these kinds of measurements in the winter because the equipment freezes, but we ha so we have more limited data in the winter time. But for example, in 2012, we were able to continue to measure phosphorus export all winter long. And you can see that there's about half of the total phosphorus coming off of this watershed um, in uh, 2012 happened during the spring snowmelt period. 
So again, we think that these are important times of years um, for um, phosphorus export in stormwater. Okay, so just to kind of conclude the first part of my talk, I hope I've shown you that these urban watersheds effectively export phosphorus to stormwater. They're just very poor at retaining phosphorus. And that litter fall, both litter fall and also runoff during intense rain events and also snow melt um, move substantial nutrients into storm drains. So those are important mechanisms by which phosphorus is exported to stormwater. Okay, so now I wanna talk about some management opportunities and challenges. And so I wanna pause um, because at this point, you're probably all thinking that I don't like trees in cities, that <laughs> trees are bad, um, and that's not the case. Um, I like trees, and I recognize that we get a lot of benefits from trees in the urban landscape, um, and in, including things like you know climate regulation. I'm sure around here, shade is highly valued. Um, in the summertime. So, you know, cooling benefits, cultural benefits, aesthetic benefits, wildlife benefits. So there's a lot of benefits that we can get from trees um, in the city. And so it's important then for us to figure out how we can manage some of the negative effects of trees in the city. And this is where I wanted to, to kind of pause and tell you about some recent work that we've been doing as part of this new LTER project related to the benefits of trees in the urban environment. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a project that's looked at kind of the legacy of past decisions that were made that have resulted in present day in environmental inequities. And so this is work that was done by a PhD student, Rebecca Walker, who's now a faculty member at the University of Illinois, and a postdoc, Hannah Raymer. And so this is a, a key figure from Rebecca's recent paper, and I'm going to walk you through it because there's a lot going on here. But basically, the story here is that um, when Minneapolis, so this is particularly, this is just showing Minneapolis, um, that when Minneapolis was being developed, that the developers basically partnered with um, city uh, officials to direct investment of resources into parkland at the same time that these developers then put into place uh, racially uh, exclusive um, housing practices, um, in particular the um, attachment of racial covenants to property deeds. And this has then led to the pattern that we see on the landscape today, where you can see that here on the left we have um, a map showing race, so this is the darker colors represent more people of color. Um, those areas are also hotter, so this is surface temperatures, those areas are hotter, and they're also the places where we don't have investment in parkland, and we also have lower tree canopy cover. And so it's hard to see in this figure, but each of these kind of little black dots represents a parcel that had, or still has in most cases probably, um, a, a racially, um, exclusionary uh, covenant. So we're basically, in the property deed, it says that you are not allowed to sell this property to a person of color. Um, and those, those uh, racial covenants became uh, illegal, you know, back in the 50s, um, although they're still on many of the deeds today, um, even though they're not enforceable. Um, but you can see that there is this pretty tight linkage between racial covenants, investment in parkland, um, tree canopy cover, and cooler temperatures, so those amenities of trees. All right, so now to think about, you know, what can we do about this, this polluting effect of trees on the landscape. So I want to talk about um, some of the approaches that people take to managing stormwater pollution. So traditional approaches to controlling phosphorus um, have focused basically on the impaired water body itself or just upstream of that water body and thinking about ways to trap phosphorus before it ends up in the water body. Um, but we can also think about source control, and I already told you that in the Twin Cities, 
um, or in Minnesota, actually, we have restrictions on the use of phosphorus in, in uh, lawn fertilizer. So we are already doing source control um, as a management tool. But there may be other mechanisms of controlling phosphorus sort of higher up in the landscape. So traditional stormwater management, as I said, kind of tends to focus at the bottom of the watershed uh, and, and attempts to trap phosphorus before it gets into uh, whatever water body we're concerned about. Um, and in, the tw in Minnesota, it's become really popular to use what's called alum or aluminum sulfate. Uh, they basically dump it into the lake um, and it binds up the phosphorus. Um, so these kinds of stormwater control measures and alum treatment are really, really expensive ways of reducing phosphorus pollution. And so there's interest in trying to find less expensive ways to do this. Um, so these are some examples of, of what I mean by source control. So we can control new inputs by restricting the use of fertilizer. So we've already done that for phosphorus, so that's not really an option for phosphorus. We can try to restore hydrologic functions. So you know how I said that there was very little opportunity to trap nutrients as they make their way into the city streets. Well, we can do things like put in rain gardens, for example, where we can slow down the water on the landscape and try to trap that phosphorus. And then another um, uh, practice, which I'm gonna focus on, is street sweeping. So this is basically removing material from the street um, so that it can't get into the storm drain. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a little bit about some work that we've been doing, um, exploring the, the effectiveness of street sweeping as a measure, a metric, or a, a measure of source control. All right, so we've been partnering with cities to basically um, determine like just how much phosphorus um, they pick up in their street sweeping operations. So these are data that we collected um, for one of these studies that we've done where basically each of the different symbols represents a different city um, around the Twin Cities Metro. Um, and then uh, we looked at the total phosphorus that was collected in sweepings um, as a function of canopy cover. So these are different routes that cities are, are sweeping and they happen to have different canopy covers. And so you can see that we get the most phosphorus being picked up in the fall months. Um, as, and there is a relationship with canopy cover where you get more material being picked up in high canopy neighborhoods. Um, and so this is when we have that peak you know, litter fall in the Twin Cities. There's also uh, a peak in June, which is when we get a lot of like flowers and seeds and things also coming into the street. And if we look at just the percentage of phosphorus in swept material that's coming from litter fall, um, you can see that, you know, it's upwards around 70% in um, October and November. So, Again, you know, this suggests that leaf litter is contributing a lot of the phosphorus to sweepings, particularly in the fall. Okay, so what, so what can we do with that information? So one of the things that we did was we evaluated the cost effectiveness of using street sweeping as a tool to remove phosphorus. And so this figure is just showing two different um, street sweeping routes. Um, and so one is a high canopy route, that's the dark solid blue line, and one is a low canopy route, the turquoise dashed line. And you can see that during the early summer, late spring, early summer, and again in the fall, in the high canopy route, it actually, the cost of removing phosphorus through street sweeping, so this is considering the cost of the equipment and the fuel and the maintenance, is less than $100 per pound. Okay, so probably a lot of you aren't used to thinking about how much does it cost to remove phosphorus from you know, streets um, and, and water. Well, this is orders of magnitude less than it would cost to, to install new stormwater ponds or to do that alum treatment especially. So this is actually a pretty cost-effective way to remove phosphorus or keep phosphorus out of water bodies if it's done in high canopy neighborhoods in the fall. Um, so there are some uh, advantages to street sweeping. It's effective for removing nitrogen and phosphorus. It's cost effective if it's targeted appropriately. But there are some barriers. It's hard to time, especially if trees are dropping their leaves at different times, which um, 
happens um, in because we have diverse species composition in our street trees. It's inconvenient for residents if they have to move their cars in order for the street sweepers to come through. It requires capital investment and street sweeping equipment. And the, the barrier that I want to focus on here for a, a second is that there's been a lack of a state certified pollution reduction credit for street sweeping in Minnesota. So every municipality that has storm drains that basically, you know, where that water is not treated has to um, get a permit in order to basically allow material to flow down those storm drains. And um, in that permitting process, they have to show the different ways that they are keeping um, phosphorus and other pollutants out of downstream water bodies. And so um, nationwide, those permits generally don't recognize street sweeping as a practice that can be used to um, meet those, those permitting requirements. Um, and so we've been working really closely with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to develop a permitting process or a, a, a mechanism so that, the, that municipalities can get basically pollution reduction credit for their street sweeping. So I'm not going to go into details about the nature of the permit, but uh, this is just a page from um, basically that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency um, uh, developed to explain to permittees how they can get credit for their street sweeping practices. And basically what they have to do is keep track of how much material they sweep, and then they use our data to estimate how much phosphorus is in that material. And then they can get credit for their street sweeping practices. So this is gonna incentivize st uh, cities to sweep more in the neighborhoods where there's a lot of material and at the times of year when there's a lot of material coming into the streets. Um, and this uh, same practice now is being uh, recommended in the state of New Hampshire where they're basically using this approach or they're recommending the use of this approach to give um, municipalities credit for their street sweeping operations um, in terms of pollution reduction. Okay, so then for this part of the talk, I just wanna conclude that you know, street sweeping at the right time, so in the fall, and in the right place, so in high canopy neighborhoods, um, is a cost-effective way of managing uh, nutrient pollution. All right, so the last thing I wanna do then um, is just spend a few minutes talking about some of the new directions that we're moving in in our LTER. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about some of the community-engaged research that um, we've begun uh, to, to do. So I'm gonna pause here and just acknowledge that all of the work that we're doing in the Twin Cities is occurring on the land of the Dakota people. So the Dakota uh, origin place, the creation story for the Dakota people um, occurs at the confluence of the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers, and they call that place Bedote. It is smack dab in the center of the Twin Cities metro region, and there are places all around the Twin Cities that are sacred to Dakota people. Um, and it is not just the historical lands of Dakota people, it's also the present day lands of Dakota people. So this is just one example. This is Oheawahi, which is, um, was a, both a gathering place as well as a burial place for Dakota people. And so one of the things that we've been kind of grappling with or think, you know, challenging ourselves to think about um, and being challenged by Dakota elders to think about is, you know, how can we use our position of privilege um, to basically elevate Dakota voices in the Twin Cities? Um, and so one of the things that we've been doing is um, partnering with uh, organization Wakan Tipi Awanyankapi. Uh, Maggie Lorenz is the executive director. And this organization is managing a nature preserve, uh, Wakan Tipi, which you can see here. Um, which also is a sacred site to Dakota people. There's a, a cave on the site that was basically bashed in and destroyed by the railroad um, company, um, but it is still a sacred place to Dakota people. And so in our work, we've been, you know, we've been focused a lot on nutrient pollution, um, but, you know, um, the Wakantipi organization, um, you know, we kind of had a serendipitous meeting with them and they said, well, you know, we're really interested in other kinds of pollution. We're really interested, in, especially in heavy metals, because this site 
um, if you actually look at an air photo of it. So this is the Wakan Tipi, this sacred site. And it's just really been abused, okay? So it was a dump, it was a rail yard. It's currently got, you know, an interstate basically going over it. It's also in the flight path of the downtown St. Paul airport. Um, so it's this like little piece of nature and sacred land, like in the middle of this, all of this urbanness. Um, and so they, were, they have people who come there to um, gather medicinal plants and food plants, and they wanted to know, you know, is it safe for people to be gathering these um, plants here at this site? Um, and so this is some work that then has grown out of this, um, this partnership. Um, this is a work that Emily Snellrude, my collaborator, has been doing, looking at lead levels in the leaves of plants that are important to the Dakota people who are coming to this site. And you can see that, in fact, um, the lead levels are elevated in plants um, at this site. Um, and so that, this led us to look at our, the stormwater data that we've been synthesizing in new ways. And so uh, this is um, work that Jacques Finlay and Chip Small have been doing. Uh, basically synthesizing data from a number of different organiz organizations on uh, storm, oh, some of the, isn't that weird? Like it shows up over there and not there. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, synthesizing data on stormwater quality. And again, you know, we'd been really focused on things like salt and nutrients, but when they looked at heavy metals, they found that in fact, oh, wow, like this area, this water, little sub-watershed you know, that basically drains um, to this creek that runs through Wakantipi is also really heavily polluted. Um, so not only are the soils polluted, but also the water. Um, and then and this has led to yet another project that's kind of an outgrowth of what we've been doing. Uh, this is led by uh, Daniel Stanton and his postdoc, Natalia. Um, Mosman Cook, and what they've been doing is basically using lichens to monitor air quality around the Twin Cities metro. And so they've gathered lichens from pristine, a pristine, single pristine area, one species of lichen, and then they attach the lichens to the trees around uh, different parts of the Twin Cities. And these lichens basically absorb air pollutants, um, and they can be a, an effective and inexpensive way of basically monitoring air quality. Um, and so this is just a, you know, a figure that shows these lichens attached to a tree, and then all the different monitoring sites. And then we have this pristine, what relatively pristine site out here uh, as a control. Um, and so this just shows the lead concentrations in these lichens after 10 months and the zinc concentrations after 10 months. And again, you can see that this region um, of East St. Paul, where Wakantipi sits, is kind of lighting up as a hot spot of air pollution. And so we're just starting to put this picture together. Um, and you know, one of the things that we think is probably going on is that uh, the St. Paul Airport is not, it's not our international airport. That's the Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport on the other side of town. Um, this little municipal airport has a lot of small planes, and these small planes actually use um, jet fuel that is still leaded, that it hasn't been, is not unleaded. Um, and so we think there's a lot of air pollution probably as a legacy, and soil and water pollution, both as a legacy of, you know, when there was a lot of use of, um, leaded fuels by cars, because there's a lot of, you know, as I said, there's like major freeways going over this area, but also because of the um, proximity to the airport and being in that flight path of the airport. Okay, so then to kind of wrap up uh, the entire talk, um, I, you know, I hope I showed you that by taking a watershed approach to understanding urban water quality, we've been able to gain some novel insights and also to um, get some ideas about solutions. And so, you know, maybe I've made you think about your own watershed in a slightly different way um, in terms of thinking about, you know, what are the sources of pollutants to your own watershed? Um, and then finally, that you know we're just kind of in the beginning stages of this, but we're making an effort to try to engage with under-resourced community partners, um, and this is starting to lead us into novel research directions and discoveries that we otherwise wouldn't have been um, focusing on. So I'm going to stop there by just acknowledging um, 
the, the funding, we have a bunch of different funding partners um, and then a, a bunch of different research partners um, that have worked with us over the years on various aspects of this work. And then my, my close collaborators as well as all the folks that are part of the LTER. So thanks again for your attention and for inviting me um, to this lecture and I'm happy to take any questions. Many thanks, Sarah, for that fascinating presentation. We have a few minutes for questions. If anyone has any, I'm going to either give the mic to you or repeat it on the microphone so they could hear it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, fall leaves, but we have uh, the biggest pest and destructive thing I can think of. It's called a leaf blower. And we have drains that say, this opens, this goes to the ocean. Don't yeah. put anything down here. And it used to be they had to pick up all the grass clippings and all this other stuff, but they just blow it all down oh, the drain. Oh, they blow it down Right the out drain. in the ocean. Oh. Right out in the ocean, you know. Okay. That's not as bad as when we first got our sewage plant and there was, they dumped it in the ocean. It was, it was off the coast and they called it the Rose Bowl. It was not treated. So, okay. but I mean, we're, all our, uh, weed killers and all that other stuff, they're just blowing right down the sewer, oh, the uh, storm so drains. So that, that's a pretty common and, practice? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. It used to be they had to pick it up and bag it, but. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so, okay, that's. So you have the fall leaves, we yeah, have the leaf blowers. Yeah, you have blowers. the leaf blowers. All right. Thank, Thank you, you for that information. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I was curious if. Uh, if there's a possibility of transitioning to planting conifers in urban green spaces as a partial solution to that possibility. Yeah, so, so that's, I often get this question. So one thing about conifers is that they actually still drop their needles in the fall. It's just that, you know, they have, a, they have needles that stick around for two years or three years or four, you know, depends on the species. But they still are, they'll lose like the, four-year-old needles, for example. And so you still can get actually quite a bit of litter fall from the conifers. But the other thing about the conifers is that they block line of sight. And so the law enforcement does not like having conifers along right next to the street just because of the line of sight issues. So unfortunately, it's not a solution. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. There's one. Uh, so I'm curious about <clears throat> what happens to the leaves. Yes. That, uh, <laughs> I'm so uh, glad you asked is that there, question. Is there a way that they can be used, perhaps in fertilizer or some, some, some way to, to actually uh, uh, benefit the environment? Yeah, yeah. This is a great question, and it's actually one that we've been grappling with because um, it's more complicated than you think it should be. Um, so, you know, in an ideal setting, right, you know, the leave the litter fall in the street represents this kind of one-way you know flux of phosphorus from the land to the water and then it's getting into the water bodies where we don't want it so it would be great if we could basically return that phosphorus to the landscape and then we might or end the other nutrients that are in leaf litter as well um, and so and when we first started working with these different municipalities you know they would be like just don't ask me what we're doing with our the stuff that we collect because they are really because right now like the so we've been working with these guys at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency on this phosphorus reduction credit but then there's like the other people at the pollution control agency that work on waste and the whole issue of this you know, material makes them really nervous because they don't, well, what else is in there, you know, and, and do we have to regulate it? And so I was just in a meeting actually last week with a couple of folks from PCA and we're um, starting to think about, you know, how could we design a project where we can basically, you know, show that, um, especially in the fall, we doubt that there's a lot of other contaminants like hydrocarbon, you know, petroleum products and, heavy metals and things in this litter fall. And so it should be safe to basically compost and use as fertilizer. But the two parts of the regulatory agency haven't been able to yet kind of get their, 
their heads together so that so that they you know so that the solid waste folks feel comfortable saying yes you can use this material for so right now it when we've surveyed different municipalities people are doing all sorts of things with it some municipalities are using it for fill some are composting in the fall they're just kind of doing it like on the you know on the down low and so um yeah it's uh there are a variety of things being done with it, but I think a lot of it is ending up in landfill as well, which is not ideal, so, yeah. Okay, last question here before we... It's for the, the, the it re recording, yeah. Um, yeah, just a quick question. Um, uh, the elephant in the room on, on the total nitrogen and phosphorus, it's that eutrophication is creating uh, a lot of methane um, and a lot of greenhouse gases some of the data is starting to show like 10, 20 percent of global emissions. So um, are you starting to see other interested parties really start to talk about the value of what you're doing, uh, talk about uh, funding sources for credits? Because we're not seeing that for green infrastructure. We're not seeing the data, so we can't get that funding. We don't have quantifiable information on the reduction in nitrogen and phosphorus, thus the reduction in in nitrous oxide or, or methane, and then we don't see that coming out in terms of greenhouse gas emissions reductions and credit and money yeah, to do yeah. the work. Yeah, that's a great question. And so it just, you know, a couple of comments. The, the short answer to your question is no, like, no. People, like, this is all the stormwater people, and they are not talking about greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we, have, we have, there's a grad student who just finished recently who, has made a, a lot of measurements of, um, of methane emissions. And one of the things that I didn't really talk about here is that, you know, we have all these lakes, but we also have thousands and thousands of ponds. And, you know, every time anybody builds, you know, a commercial building, they have to build a stormwater pond. And a lot of those ponds are, you know, go anoxic. Um, and, and and then they're actually starting to talk about adding alum to the, like, these ponds, you know. And so, and we've actually got, this is, I'm getting totally, can I do this, get totally off track? But one of the things that's really cool, cool is that in the fall, if it gets really cold before it snows in Minnesota, these ponds freeze over. And you can see all the methane bubbling under. And so we've lit them, we lit them on fire. Yeah, so you like crack a hole in the ice and then, you know, it's like the only time my kids ever thought I was cool was when we went out and like lit the methane bubbles on fire which is sounds fun but it's also like a really bad issue I mean environmentally right yeah we were healthy we were converting it to co2 yeah um, so I the, sh the short answer though is no like people are not talking about that as a reason to regulate either you know total solids organic matter inputs to these water bodies um, so, but it would be a, a benefit as, but if all this stuff is going to landfill, then it's probably contributing methane emissions, you know, in the landfill. So that's another reason that we have to kind of create a, close the circle on the, this material. Yeah, yeah, great question. All right, thank you. I'm going to conclude the Q&A there, but I'm sure Sarah would be delighted to answer any questions that you didn't get to, to ask. And I would, again, like to welcome all of you to join us next door, um, through the door. Uh, there'll be a reception and food and drinks, and so please join us. And thank you again, Sarah, yeah, for a great welcome. talk. Thanks for coming.